Good morning. My name is Bob Carey. I'm president of the New School University in New York City, a university that has historically been engaged in an effort to try to help the public understand critical issues of the day. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that I'm joined in a panel discussion today by three individuals that know a great deal about what's going on on an issue that is of extreme uh, interest to everybody in the United States today, which is the status of health care reform in the United States Congress. Uh, Kate Leone is the senior health counsel to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. Uh, she works on Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, health coverage, prescription drug, medical device issues, and probably more than, than that. Uh, Dr. John McDonough is the senior health uh, policy advisor to Senator Ed Kennedy, uh, who himself is the chairman of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, Dr. McDonough is the former executive director of the Health Care for All, which is Massachusetts. Uh, leading consumer health advocacy organization. Uh, Russ Sullivan, uh, who I knew in a former life when I was in the United States Senate for 12 years and I'm also on the Finance Committee. Russ is the Democratic Staff Director for the Senate uh, Committee on Finance and plays a leading role as a consequence in helping the Senate Finance Committee, which is led by Senator Max Baucus, shape this reform effort. Uh, profiles of our guests uh, can be found by clicking on the Speaker Profiles tab under the slide portion of your viewer. Um, uh, so I won't offer any additional detail beyond what I've done. I just want to thank you. I know it's a, a busy time um, and a difficult time. This is a, a tough issue because it's, it's, it's very personal. Uh, all of us uh, take health care personal when it's us, when it's our wives or family. Um, uh, uh, the uh, issue becomes very personal when you're operating a business. We're, I'm, we're a not-for-profit, but as an employer, I'm uh, very conscious of the cost and the difficulty. Uh, providing health insurance, uh, particularly for people who are uh, uh, working for us part-time. So <clears throat> all of us take the issue very personal. So uh, what I'd like to start with is just a, a couple of open-ended questions. The first is, you know, what are the chances something gets done? Uh, and uh, what happens if something doesn't get done? You know, what, 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 uh, what happens to the cost of health care? What happens to the number of uninsured? What happens to health care as a cost inside the federal budget? So, John. So, <coughs> we can look back on the last time that we tried to do this in 1993-94 and see what's happened over the past 16 years or so and use that as a guide to inform us on what we can expect to see happen if we fail to take advantage of this reform window of opportunity. We see in general over the last 16 years the number of uninsured going up by about a million a year and it's probably accelerating even faster now since the economic downturn. So the national estimates right now about 46, 47 million uninsured, but probably we think it's probably somewhere over 50 at this point um, because of all the folks who've lost their jobs over the past year. And so we can expect to see the number of uninsured rising at a much more substantial rate if we fail to fundamentally change the structure and the nature of how people get coverage. Uh, we've seen just over the past 10 years the cost of health care, the cost of medical care, and the cost of health insurance more than double over the course of this decade. And all estimates suggest that if we do nothing, those costs are going to continue to rise at a rate that is two or three times the rate of growth of the overall economy the rate of, of, of inflation generally, and so that will create even greater distress on employers, on individuals and families, on government at all levels, the federal government, state government, county and local governments. Um, so those are two of probably the most difficult things that will happen and it will create pressures throughout in terms of people getting access to the care they need and creating a lot of economic dislocation which hurts the country and slows us down from where we otherwise could be if we had a health system that operated at the level of efficiency and effectiveness that we know it can. Well, John is right that the two factors that he mentioned are not unrelated. We have an increasing number of uninsured individuals. I would also add that we have a, a large number of underinsured people. They have some type of insurance policy, but it really doesn't meet their needs, their health care needs and to, to some extent many of them are faced with the same situation that uninsured individuals have. But that has been a major factor in the increase in cost. And uh, you know, while this is a generalization, I think uh, most uh, economists and those who've looked at it 
have uh, agreed that it's true. That when people ha get sick, if they don't have insurance or they have substandard insurance, their inclination is, I need to go to the doctor. Well, not that many doctors in the U.S. will take patients if you don't have insurance unless you prove you can pay cash on the spot. Some do, but not that many. That leads people to perhaps go into a clinic that has a lower cost structure. Uh, those are not available in all areas, and so what we ha have, what has emerged over the past few years is an increasing number of people who go to the emergency room at the hospital. We have federal laws that require hospitals to treat patients even if they cannot pay, but the fact is that our hospital system, uh, the, no the amount of uncompensated care that they provide, either charity care or just people that maybe don't qualify for charity but don't pay, has increased to above $20 billion a year. And what do those hospitals do, whether they're not-for-profit or for-profit, they have to uh, either you know, maintain uh, at least an, an even bottom line, and so they shift those costs to others who have insurance who can pay, and those rates go up. Yeah, and along those lines, people who have insurance in America today are spending over $1,000 more a year to pick up those costs of the uninsured, and those costs are only going to grow. And for people who do have insurance, they're living day to day and in seeing increasing premiums and potentially going to lose their coverage. 14,000 Americans lose their health insurance every single day. And if we do nothing, that's going to continue. So this is going to become a bigger problem as we move forward with absent action. <clears throat> I mean, it, it does seem that uh, a tremendous amount has changed uh, since the last time uh, that was a major effort in 1994. Uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd ask you again, just because I've ask you two questions and back to the first part of it, which is, it seems to me there's more reason to believe that Congress is going to take action as a consequence of the things that have happened over the last 15 or 16 years. And so, from your, just from your vantage point, are you optimistic that at some point, not saying when, but at some point that um, a bill will be delivered to President Obama for his signature? Yes, I am. I think there's been a consensus has emerged uh, in, within um, the the Congress, the members, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, that we need to do something. I think most people have have analyzed the trend lines that John mentioned and and view it as as unsustainable uh, from different perspectives and vantage points. For some, it's looking at the U.S. as as in its role in the world in the competitive market. That if our cost structure for health care and retirement is much higher than in other countries, it will be more difficult for U.S. companies to compete globally, and that will down, press down our economy. For others, it's really looking at the quality of care for every American, and uh, I think even the the business community in the, in the United States in the healthcare has taken a very different approach to healthcare reform this time than they did in 1994. Uh, a number of industries have said we think that it is time to reform the system, and we'll. Uh, be willing to uh, sit down and and contribute to that effort. Yeah, to the question I asked earlier about what happens if nothing is done, I'm wondering if I could <clears throat> get a couple of charts uh, put up. The first one that I think is uh, quite uh, uh, startling, actually, and it's, it's, it's been discussed a lot, is chart number 10 that shows uh, growth in wages and health spending. This just goes out to 2017, but it shows changes from uh, 1999. I think you've got, the, no, it's chart number 10. It's headline, growth in wages and health spending. There it is there. Um, and you can see the, the, the separation there, the red being health spending and the blue being wages. It's one of the, one of the questions people ask is, why is this thing becoming an important issue? Why has health care gotten more um, unaffordable? And the reason is, since you pay for it with your wages, uh, if, there's a, if, a, if there's a differential between the growth of wages and the growth of health care spending, it's, uh, uh, the cost of health care, it produced pressure uh, on uh, the families themselves. Is this a dynamic that you're hearing uh, 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 about, not just from the members, but from the people they represent? I think people get it. People understand that the cost growth is unsustainable, it can't last, it can't keep going. The challenge is what we're going to do to try to slow it down and to put ourselves on a different path. And that's where it gets difficult. Um, and right now, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of confusion. Um, people are, are unclear. 
And that's a familiar pattern. I mean, we saw that back in 1994. I recall back in 1994, there, were, there was a group that did a poll, and they, this is when everybody was getting disenchanted with the Clinton health plan. And they asked, said, well, what if you had a health plan that did this, 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 and this? And something like 75 to 80 percent of the folks polled said, that's what we want. Why can't we have that? Well, in truth, what was described was the Clinton health plan, but without the label on top of it. And so when we get into the heat of this moment. If it had been the Kerry health plan, do you think it had been? <laughs> that would have been all the difference, I'm sure. But so there's, there's a lot of confusion. But, but we're, we're helped, we're informed by the memory of that last episode and what went wrong and and I think people have a better awareness of the kinds of things that happen when you get into the red heat the, of, of this moment and uh, we're in there now and uh, but we are optimistic because it is so important for the nation that we get this done. But for most Americans it is the the bill <laughs> for their doctor visit or their hospital stay or their annual premium or the deduction that's taken from their paycheck for business owners who are trying to cover their employees with some health insurance. It's the negotiation with the insurance companies realizing that yet again this year their premiums are going to go up, uh, the cost of the plan is going to go up by 8 to 10 percent after a series <coughs> of years where that has already occurred that is increasing people's frustration with the status quo and saying we've got to do something to lower the costs. Yeah, I wonder, yeah, go ahead, they're and they're needing to pass that along. The employers can only bear so much, so their workers are paying it too. They're paying higher premiums, they're paying increased cost sharing. They may have a higher deductible this year than they had last year. They may have higher co-payments when they visit a doctor. And at some point, employers face a choice of do they continue to insure their workers or do they continue to stay afloat and they have to pick between that and that's an unsustainable choice. You know, one of the things that was started <clears throat> under the Bush administration, the, uh, the, the second Bush administration that Mark McClellan, who was the head of the uh, uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services put in place and, and I hear talked about a lot uh, which is uh, uh, increased payment for quality and trying to uh, try actually control the, the increase of, of Medicare spending. And I wonder if you could put uh, chart number six up as well, because that's also, I know, something that Congress faces all the time, which is a growing share of the entitlement uh, programs and Medicare being the, and Medicaid being the biggest ones inside the federal budget itself. Is, is, is payment reform uh, uh, something we're going to see? And, and, and is it it's something important that the public ought to pay attention to? It is critical. I think it will be included in any legislation. And I think there's an uh, unusual amount of actually agreement on the direction that uh, Congress should head with respect to this issue. I think most of the senators uh, have expressed the view that we ought to move away from a situation that rewards doctors and providers based on the volume of services that they provide and move more toward uh, rewarding them or making payments based on the quality of care that they provide. In other words, if they can provide better care with less MRIs, then we still ought to reward the providers for that better quality care. And we also heard the, uh, last night at the, uh, the President's press conference, he talked a lot about uh, health medical records and health IT as a way to make the system more efficient. Is that something that uh, has bipartisan support. It seems to me that as well, I, I hear both Republican and Democrats talk about that. So is that something that the public ought to uh, focus on and expect to see in any kind of a reform bill? Well, we, we did a major down payment on that in the stimulus legislation earlier this year, about a $20 billion investment in putting the whole nation on a new platform to have electronic health records and health information technology more generally available. And there are clearly some system savings from doing that. Partly what I think people understand is that you need to have a good electronic medical record platform to be able to do the disease management, to do the care management, to do the payment for quality that you want. And in fact, it's very difficult to do those things if you're in a 19th century medical record system. So there really is an aggressive piece we made a major down payment that was one of the key achievements of stimulus in terms of the health system and we hope 
in all of the versions that are moving forward, House and Senate, that we're going to take that to the next level. Well, uh, help me with this because this is when I hear down payment, I make a down payment. It's in today's world, 25 percent, maybe 10, 20, 25. How much? How much more is needed? And uh, uh, are, is, is that going to be a federal expenditure to provide, to, uh, particularly to? clinics and providers that may not have the resources to do it? Is that, a, is that a, again, is there a cost issue attached to that that we ought to be Initially, focusing? yes, but I think the general uh, path that we're on is to initially provide incentives for providers and doctors to participate in this network, give them time to get used to that, give them an added reimbursement. Uh, however, over time, then at some point we expect them to participate, and if they don't participate, then we will give them a penalty. At that point, it doesn't become as big of a cost issue from the federal government. In fact, we will reap, re, reap some reimbursements because of lower payments to those who choose not to participate in the technologically advanced system. And that's critical for saving money in the system over the long term, but also for improving patient care. So that one doctor, so your cardiologist knows what you've been prescribed when you've gone to your primary care physician or another specialist. And sometimes right now you have one doctor prescribing something that may interact in an inappropriate way with the first prescription you're already taking and if you don't go back to the same pharmacy no one knows and so we have a lot of medical errors and problems that occur and and cause people serious health problems that then obviously are problematic from that perspective but also a cost perspective and so over the long term we're going to improve care by having that system in place. Can I open this up a bit? I mean I, I, I note that uh, the Mayo Clinic which was referenced as an a, a, a uh, an efficient uh, system uh, had some complaints. I don't know if it's which piece of legislation they're referring to. And that, uh, what, it was what's the House bill? The House bill. Well, what's the nature of the complaint? I mean, it, it seemed to center on this payment reform issue uh, that it didn't go far enough to pay for quality. Is that the is that the primary objection, or do you know? I haven't seen the precise letter, so I just read some of the stories, and I think that they're hoping for some more aggressive cost containment vehicles in the legislation and we are working very hard on that and this is still a work in progress Senate finance this has been uh, a almost pathological um, commitment on their part and Senator Bacchus's part to really get at this in a way so I think we're really expecting that as this process unfolds it is going to get a lot deeper. Do you feel like it's pathological Russ? <laughs> <laughs> I mean in a good way. In a good way. I don't think you that's have, what we, yeah. I don't think pathological can be a good way. <laughs> if, if, it's about, if it's about fixing and you're costs, a public health it is guy. good. It yeah. is good. It is good. I meant it in a positive way. John's right. There's a broad-based commitment to reduce costs across the system. We've got to reduce costs to the individuals who are purchasing their insurance or as Kate said are paying the premiums through their employer provided uh, insurance. We've got to reduce the cost to businesses so that they can better compete, and we've got to reduce the cost to the federal and state governments over time. Uh, otherwise, and we, otherwise, we'll be in a situation where you have to cut other non-health programs or raise taxes, neither of which are attractive options. And so what we're doing is trying to look at every way we can to give people, companies, and governments uh, incentives to really look to be the most efficient that they can be. You know, you, you, I'll, I'm, I'm sorry. Clearly, yeah. cost is a huge focus for everyone, for the House, for the Health Committee, for the Finance Committee. We spent $2.5 trillion a year on health care in this country in 2009. If we don't do anything, we're going to spend $7 trillion by 2025. It's, so the House bill certainly made an effort to get at those issues. I think they did some pretty aggressive um, cost containment measures. Mayo has been a model for everyone, and they're taking a look at, at sort of how they operate, and I think we're all looking to improve, and the House bill is, um, takes some pretty aggressive reforms in Medicare, and I think, you know, they're working together to try and come up with something that My, for me, for it's a lot, a lot simpler, Senator. I have four teenage sons. They love to go to eat at Chipotle, and if I take them to Chipotle and Pops is going to pay for the bill, they will order, you know, extra chicken, extra steak, they'll get the guac and chips, and they'll get the kind of fruit drink that is, you know, costs two, two and a half bucks. But if I say, you got ten dollars, you know, for your dinner, they will scrutinize the menu, and they will get a full meal that's probably just as healthy for that ten dollars than if I even open into tab. 
And so we've got to find ways within our healthcare structure to help people understand the choices they're making, the economics of that, not only on them, but on the insurance company, the hospital, and the system, so that if people will work together, they can make wise choices, which will put some downward pressure on the cost. But how do you do that? I mean, I, I mean, Kate says, okay, we're, we're headed to spend seven and a half trillion, we spend two and a half trillion dollars now. Uh, let's say the bill flattens that out and we only go to five trillion dollars instead of seven and a half. Doesn't that mean we're going to spend less? Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it unrealistic to presume that I'm going to get all that, uh, that money, that, uh, that five trillion dollars or whatever the number is, just by making the system more efficient? Isn't there have to be, in, aren't I going to have to expect as an individual um, uh, to have some restraint? Uh, placed upon me upon what I want to do that I'm not going to be able to fly off to the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic every time I want to do something that I, I mean isn't there isn't there going to have to be some requirement for me to to expect that I'm not going to be able to get every single thing I want paid for by somebody else I think the experts is that what you're saying in the with, with your example or not yes well, the experts that have looked at this, though, show, and I think the New Yorker article that came out recently, the Atul Gawande New Yorker article that's all the rage and everyone's talking about, put forth some of this research that the experts take a look, and if you're getting the quantity of care sometimes results in poor health outcomes, worse health outcomes than if you'd had less care. So I think that that's, it's not a question of um, ratcheting back things that you think you need and you want, it's a question of determining what's appropriate and rewarding that quality. And that's the Medicare reforms that they're looking at in the Finance Committee. And we all know that private insurance sometimes follows what Medicare does. And so that's what's important is to determine that we're doing the right care and not care that people don't need that actually makes them worse off. So here's a specific example. Under current law, uh, hospitals can get reimbursed for certain levels for the services they provide to individuals who get services in their hospitals. And if the person leaves the hospital and then comes back, they get another set of payments for the serving that individual. And so we have a high rate of, re of readmissions of hospitals, particularly among our elderly. One of the things we're considering is saying, Look, we're not going to provide you quite as much reimbursement for readmission of an individual within a certain time period of when they've been discharged from the hospital before. That kind of structure will encourage the doctors, the hospitals, the care technicians, to try to make sure that, well, maybe the best thing for this person would be to go to a rehab facility for a while after they leave the hospital. Let's work that out so that the person is not going to return to the hospital uh, in a short time period. You, you mentioned that the, 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 the New Yorker piece that you know, this Atul Gawande, Gawande uh, wrote, and um, it, it must say, just from the outset, it, it was a little disturbing to see people get all excited about it. I mean, I don't think well, I mean, as good as, as Mayo is, that's not, it's not a community hospital, is it? I mean, they, they, they don't, I mean, it, in some ways they skim the, the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the patients that go there, right? I mean, it's, it, it, to compare uh, every single community hospital to Cleveland or to Mayo Clinic, it seems to me, sets up a, a false comparison and a false expectation that we're all going to end up like Cleveland or Mayo unless the proposal is to put all the docs on salary. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a waiting list to get into Cleveland and Mayo. Not everybody gets to go to Cleveland and Mayo, right? I right, mean, and to some extent that's not fair. A small rural community hospital isn't going to have the same resources as a Mayo or a Cleveland clinic. But what we do need to do, I think, is align the incentives so that everyone can perform as best they can. And, and it's I not fair in some ways that someone who goes to a rural community hospital can't get the same level of care as someone who has the money to get into Mayo or Cleveland Clinic. Right. And it is legitimate to compare Mayo to other major academic teaching centers and how well they are doing and the value that they're providing and the incentives that are embedded in that system and the incentives embedded in the systems in the Mayos and the Cleveland Clinics are much more focused on doing what's right for the patient as opposed to doing the maximum amount of volume of services that you can possibly squeeze into them. Presuming that the educational institution you're talking about doesn't have some sort of state mandates imposed upon it, things that it has to do, or things that it can't do, which may or may not mm -hmm. uh, face. I haven't heard that that's a big part of the issue that explains the difference between them. 
No, but I just, I, I, I just, I do think that there's a, a legitimate concern that when you start comparing a community hospital with mm -hmm. Mayo, uh, and you're not proposing right. to put all the docs on payroll, which they are. I mean, it's uh, and Cleveland Clinic as well. They're all on salary. It sets off. It seems to me a legitimate concern on the outside of what's what. What does the comparison prove other than? So don't compare Mayo to a community hospital. Compare Mayo to another academic teaching hospital, and that's yeah. that's the appropriate connection that's that's I think a legitimate comparison let me, let me we were going to actually wait to the end but I think I'll try to pull off some questions off of the off of the uh, people that are watching this thing can you can you read that uh, along with me I, I, it just says first question we've got up there is why are health policy elites still advocating for investor-owned profit-oriented managed care organizations which have a primary goal of maximizing profits and report in the New England Journal of Medicine in 97 issue Average is approximately nine and a half percent more in administrative costs than private not-for-profit hospitals. Is that a is that a question that can you that, that isn't a question for me. That's a question for you. Can you can you tackle that one? Sure. Um, like, since you are you a health policy elite, do you feel comfortable <laughs> with that? I feel like it sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't take much. <laughs> I think that there is part of, a, an important part of what we are attempting to accomplish here that the President has enunciated repeatedly and the Senate leaders and, and the House leaders and folks is to make sure that we have a distinctly American solution to the problem of health care policy, the, 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 the health care crisis that we're facing and that we are looking to be able to keep people in the kind of systems and care that they're in right now that for the most part people say they like. I mean when people are asked, do you like your physician, 80% of Americans say yes. When people are asked, do you like your hospital, 80% of Americans say yes. When people are asked, do you like your health insurer, 80% of Americans generally say yes. What they don't like is they don't like the cost, they don't like the financial exposure they're faced, and they don't like some of the quality problems. But so we are not looking to re-engineer the ownership structure of the American health care system. We are attempting to focus on those issues that are of most critical importance that have been identified by Americans repeatedly as the places that they want to address. And we're making a really hard good faith effort to try to get at the essential core problems. The other question has just gone off the screen, but I, I, I think I can remember it, which is that uh, health care is being referred to as a commodity, not as a basic human right. Um, I, I, I see a decreasing number of people actually talking about health care on the congressional side as a commodity. I mean, it does seem to me that the presumption that it's, that it's, that it's, a, that it's an essential human right uh, is embedded in most of the arguments that are being made for reform. Is that correct? Or is there still, is there a disagreement about whether it's a, a commodity to be purchased versus a a basic uh, human right. I think the senators believe that every American should have affordable quality health care and, and speak of it in, in those terms. The, the difference emerges in how best to provide that. Is it best to provide that through governmental programs like we have Medicare, Medicaid, children's health insurance, state-based programs, or is it better to provide that care through the private sector nonprofit organizations or for-profit organizations. Uh, and that's where uh, the debate really seems to be centered. And, and to be clear, over the past several years, there really has been tremendous progress in getting consensus around the idea that everyone should have coverage on both sides of the aisle. And I think the Finance Committee is working with Republican members on their committee that believe the same thing. And I think that that's a, that's a real step forward from where we were, and that's a real difference from five years ago even, that everyone, everyone is talking in the construct Republican that everyone, and Democrat. Republicans and Democrats, that everyone should have coverage. But in addition to that, going back to what you said earlier, Senator, about uh, the cost to individuals, what, what do they need to do? Uh, we are also exploring something that is uh, new and different, which is requiring people to have health insurance coverage. Uh, all the, both bodies, all the committees have looked at saying, we are going to expect that everyone will at least have some type of minimum coverage 
and be expected to go out and, and get a policy. Now that will be provided either through uh, the private sector with some government subsidies for lower income people or provided through uh, your employer or provided through Medicaid or one of our other uh, government programs. Can you talk a little bit, Russ, about the difference between the, the public option and the, what's the word for the? The, the co-op. Co talk a little bit about how, uh, how the public option would work, which I mm -hmm. think, is, it, is that in the help bill? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it's in the Senate yep. bill, it's in the House bill. Uh, how, how, is, how does a public option work differently than the co-op? Well, uh, all the, there are a variety of options that have been discussed both in the Senate and the House, uh, and w what they all have in common is that, that they uh, presume that we need more competition in the insurance market, that uh, private for-profit insurance companies ought to have more competition. Uh, where different proposals have emerged it is on the point of how do you do that. One option is to have a program that competes in the, in the market for people up to age 65 uh, who, who otherwise would be in employer provided care or in the individual market with a program that is structured like Medicare. It's a, the federal government will get a network of providers uh, could encourage or require doctors to participate in it if they want to participate in Medicare or Medicaid and uh, provide services more directly. Uh, there are other ways to do it where uh, it's not exactly like those programs. It could be more like our current Medicare Part D program with prescription drug coverage where it's a government organized system but it's private insurance policies that are offered. In the Finance Committee we are looking at a, a proposal that would encourage the establishment of cooperatives uh, to set up their own rules on a local regional basis to uh, compete and to provide coverage where the people who are part of the co-op are the owners and therefore because they don't have a profit motive uh, they would hope to provide health care at a, at a lower cost. And is there, is there under discussion as well something about something effective the co-op doesn't work the fallback becomes a uh, you know, a, a, a public option. Senator yeah. Snow from Maine has has talked about uh, setting up a structure where you you try to establish these co-ops, but if if they don't emerge to provide care on a sufficient basis, that then you would go to a a, a stronger system uh, with more government involvement. That in fact is the structure that was included in the Medicare prescription drug legislation in 2004, and uh, that more public government-run option has not been triggered because there was sufficient uh, offerings in all parts of the country so that uh, that stronger public option has not emerged at this point. Uh, now we, I think we, did, we covered that one. Let's say everybody gets covered as uh, the president proposed last night. I totally agree with him. I want to know how people who don't follow healthy practices should be treated. Wouldn't folks help me or scroll up? But in folks who, uh, what do they do? Eat irresponsibly, who don't exercise, who smoke, who use illegal and or legal drugs, et cetera, be burdens for other taxpayers? Uh, would they also increase the health care inflation? Is there are there mechanisms being discussed, higher rates or something that people would pay? Or that In that, in the uh, HELP Committee legislation, there is an allowance for rating based on tobacco use. Um, so that uh, smokers could be charged somewhat higher premiums than non-smokers. Uh, we also continue and expand and modify um, a provision in existing law allowing uh, employers to take uh, participation in wellness programs um, into account in terms of health insurance rating and how much employees have to pay. So we look to build some of those things in. But mostly in, in the HELP Committee legislation, we have an entire separate title devoted to prevention and wellness to really put the nation's health care system on a different platform in terms of uh, creating structures, incentives, and other kinds of opportunities where we're going to reorient our system away from simply sickness care and toward preventive care. Uh, that is, in our view, the essential important future 
of our healthcare system is to get ourselves to a place where we are preventing heart disease, we're preventing cancer. Um, there are uh, approaches and techniques and understanding and ways of doing this and there's more money to be saved in prevention and wellness than in all of the other delivery system reforms we're doing combined, we believe. Well, let me, let me uh, shift a little bit to the, the cost of the program because that's also been out there in the, in the, on the public side and it's a big change because it's also, it, it, I would argue, one of the changes since 1994 because uh, we began to accumulate additional debt in 2001 and with stimulus and uh, supplemental appropriations for Afghanistan and Iraq, there's, there's uh, you know, a pretty sharp increase in, in public debt and so the cost of this program becomes uh, a different matter today than it was the, the public cost of the, of, of the program. And talk to me a little bit about that because it, it, it seems to me that CBO has sent a pretty sharp um, shot across the bow of uh, the, what, what the, particularly what the House has put out in terms of its potential impact on the economy. And since, you know, right now the economic pie appears to be shrinking, whatever you, whatever you put out there on the public side, you've got to get it from, got to get somewhere from the economy. And uh, uh, how is that affecting the debate in the, in, the, in, the, in the Congress, particularly in the Senate? Well, in two ways. One is there is a commitment, broad-based, Republican, Democrat, and the Obama administration, that this legislation ought to be revenue neutral, that we ought to pay for whatever the program costs. And I, I don't think there's any doubt that that's, that's what we are going to do in the, in the Senate. And when we get a combined help committee, finance committee bill, it will be uh, revenue neutral. But uh, secondly, there's an issue of then where do you go for those offsets? In the Finance Committee, uh, we uh, are attempting to, and I think we will, for the most part, if not wholly, stick within the health care system for the offsets. In other words, we're going to expect industries that will benefit from uh, increased number of people with insurance to participate and, and help pay for the bill. So uh, earlier I talked about hospitals who have a lot of uncompensated care if we get insurance to every American, then uh, those hospitals won't have as much compensated care. They'll actually have a higher percentage of people paying for their care. In that context, then, uh, the, we, we can ask the hospitals, and in fact, uh, the National Association has agreed to reduce the amount of federal payments to these hospitals for uncompensated care. So they're contributing to the cost. And in the Senate, at least, I think we will uh, stick within ideas that are part of the health care system so that our overall health care uh, expenditures in our economy are not increased as a total amount but instead we are reforming it within the system. Can, but, I, can I have one sure. little piece of that too that I think is really important in terms of context? So we're talking about spending somewhere between under a trillion to a trillion and a half over ten years. And I would people, say under a trillion. <laughs> People look at that and say, wow, that's a lot of money. Okay, but keep it in context over a 10 year period as a nation, making no changes at all, the United States will spend somewhere between 35 and 40 trillion dollars on our health care system. And so understanding that as a denominator and adding another just under a trillion to cover about 17 percent of the American public that has no access to services right now. Um, is it, it just, I think that puts it in an appropriate context for people to understand. But from my own experience here, I mean, uh, my memory is that in, when it comes to uh, entitlement spending, Medi uh, uh, the CBO oftentimes underestimates uh, what the costs are going to be, not overestimates the, uh, uh, the cost. And, and I know, again, this, you're not doing this, you're staffers, but when I was here, uh, we would oftentimes um, devise a tax proposal, let's say, um, um, so that uh, it stayed within the 10-year window, and it actually might cost more. It, it expired, you know, the expi <laughs> expiring ones are done. I mean, I mean, just what I'm trying to say is there's skepticism. I mean, I think Medicare was forecast to cost $20 billion when it first passed or something like that. So there's skepticism that whatever the forecasted dollar amount is, particularly in an environment where people are being told don't worry, there's not going to be any caps on your annual expenditures, they're not going to be, you're going to get more and you're going to pay less. It, it just doesn't seem 
realistic. I mean, again, I, I, I hear people say, I, I, I want uh, to give every American what my family has got. And uh, it oftentimes just feels unrealistic given what I know about the cost of high-quality care. And the thing, that, the thing that I guess I keep in mind is every other nation on the planet, every other advanced nation on the planet covers all of its citizens and does it. The second most expensive system on the planet is Switzerland's. And they do it for every dollar we spend. They spend about sixty-five cents, but and they cover Ed, they cover everybody. So there is a, so if every nation on the planet were in the same place, then I'd say, yeah, this just doesn't add up. But the truth is, that's not it. We are the outlier, and right. in fact, the vast amount of money that we're spending suggests that there is in fact a vast opportunity to do this better and to do this right and that's what we're all house and senate really trying to achieve i agree but you're not proposing the swiss system so i mean if if, if you're proposing the swiss system we'd have an apple to compare against an apple you're proposing to modify an american system and the american system includes uh... budget rules and and i've lived within those budget rules mm -hmm. and i know how maybe maybe they're not behaving that way today they probably aren't behaving as badly as i did when i was here but there's an incentive to underestimate it in the in the health bill, the class act is is scored as a as a spending reduction. A new entitlement for long term care is, is scored by CBO as a spending reduction. Now, how is that possible? Well, that's possible over the ten year budget right, window. Right, exactly. First, You're making my point. It's window. possible yes. because of the budget rules and the way CBO scores. That's that. But I, it's all, but it's also and and we we accepted an amendment in our health committee markup from Senator Gregg in terms of making sure that the premiums that are collected will put it on an actuarially sound basis over the long term. So in fact, it's possible that the savings actually over that first 10 year window will actually be greater than what CBO scored. But, I, but only in, I got to say with great uh -huh. respect, only in Washington you, you call it a savings to have people paying basically mm -hmm. a premium for 10 years without any benefits in the first four or five, you score that as a savings. That mm -hmm. CBO scores it as a spending reduction even though there's revenue, more mm -hmm. revenue flowing in than flowing out. That's based for, for a new... I'm just saying that yeah. mm -hmm. the, the, the baseline here is, I think, there's skepticism about whatever the CBO is estimating, that they, that they actually might underestimate mm -hmm. what the actual public costs are going to be. Two points, Senator. First of all, the only thing we all know for sure about the CBO estimates, that's Congressional Budget Office, is that they will be wrong. It's just a question of which way they'll be wrong. Now, I'll challenge your supposition that they're always wrong by underestimating. The Medicare prescription drug benefit legislation, they actually overestimate the cost. The costs in the first four years uh, so far have been well under the projected cost to the federal government. So there, there are examples that go the other way. Where we, there seems to be consistent uh, consensus is our whole package is going to have to convince not only economists within our government but the American people that we are bending the growth curve in health care costs. That we're flattening out this inflation rate that is now 8 or 10 percent to get it close to uh, normal inflation throughout the economy or even flat. And, and I don't think a bill will pass unless we're pers persuasive in that and, effort. And, one, and, one of the, and just, just remember the 90s, okay? And, and the 90s we faced a lot of national concern about the federal budget and the federal fiscal situation. And Congress and the President came together and acted. And in 2000, we were looking at economic projections that said surpluses as far as the eye could see. And it was in those eight years in the early part of this decade with the, uh, with the tax cuts, with the unfunded prescription drug benefit, with the unfunded wars, where our fiscal situation has gone, in, has gone into haywire. But we have addressed this before, and there's a, an intense seriousness in Congress to address it again. And if you look at the baseline and the way the baseline is growing with ab absent action, right. we're looking at costs at, at 10 years from now that are going to be far higher than what we're spending now. And so. there's a recognition that if we don't begin to get our arms around this health care conundrum, mm -hmm. dilemma, crisis, then we are never going to get the nation's fiscal house back in order. But part of it has to be helping those folks who are totally shut out and are facing bankruptcy in record numbers just because they get sick. It's just, it's not right. Well, I agree with that. That's a good summary that you <laughs> just made there. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we've got 31 seconds. I don't even want to ask another question. I, I, 
Uh, is 30 seconds a filibuster if I go on for 30 seconds? Uh, How's New York? New York's great. <laughs> I do uh, very much appreciate your uh, participating in this, but mostly I want to thank you. I know, again, from my own experience, you guys, whatever the member has to work, you have to work five more hours. So um, I know it's, a, it's very contentious and enormously important, and I, I hope you're right. I hope something gets done because I think the status quo is unacceptable. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you. Thank you.